welcome everyone to our Women, Divorce and Retirement uh, webinar. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that all attendees are muted and off video, but the event is being recorded. And if you have a question, please type it into the chat box at the bottom right of your screen. Um, uh, panelists, uh, we will have panelists uh, speak to their top items and cover questions um, as we go through the webinar today. And uh, as a reminder, everyone will receive a link to the recording when it's posted on Retirement uh, Daily. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our subject matter experts for today's uh, webinar. We have Rick Fingerman, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Financial Planning Solutions. We have Katie Marzen, who is a wealth advisor for Buckingham Strategic Wealth, and Amy Shepard, who is a financial planner at Sensible Money. Um, welcome. So the, uh, the order of business today is in essence to uh, look at uh, what happens now that your divorce is final. Uh, where do you begin as you contemplate your new life as a divorced woman? And uh, Katie, we're gonna start with you. Uh, you've developed a checklist that outlines the topics that divorcees need to address, including how assets and the like, uh, like a house get divided. Um, where do you suggest that they begin? So one of the best places to start is to really take a step back and what I, I like to call it really redesigning your future. So take, and what I mean by that is starting from scratch with really all of your financial plans to reassess what's important with you and how maybe your goals have changed for the future. There's likely been changes in your life, some big, some small, changes around income sources, cash flow expenses, maybe where you live, how much assets you have towards retirement. There's been quite a bit of changes. So I recommend people really just take a step back and start with the basics of putting together a new plan and focusing on what their goals are. So kind of thinking through what do you want your financial future to look like? Have your goals changed? Your aspirations changed? Has your timeline maybe for retirement or other things changed? And then taking a look and figuring out, okay, what do we need to change as far as your finances go to support those goals? And not everybody's ready to do this on day one, but the idea is to get you start starting to think about how some of these changes in your life should change your overall plans. Right. You mentioned um, goals-based planning. Why, why is that important? It's important because it is really focused on you as an individual and what you're trying to accomplish rather than um, just focusing on a, a return figure or other things. It's to make sure that your needs are met as an individual and that you get where you're trying to go at the end of the day. Yeah. So in terms of cash flow, two things that probably might be um, different than they were before you were divorced is the notion of having child support and uh, and alimony, is that something that people need to sort of weigh into their plans as they think about their basics? Yeah, and it, it varies so widely from, from every individual. So cash flow in general has likely changed a lot, um, going from possibly one income to two, or two incomes to one, or one to, to having just um, support payments. So starting a really close look at your cash flow, where is the money going? What expenses do you have? That is a great place to start just to, to reassess everything and see how it fits in with, with your plans. Yeah. A Amy, Rick, anything to add to that? Amy? I, I, I would just always echo what Katie says. I think just having your goals figured out, knowing what's important to you, if you know that it makes it a lot easier to start tackling all the financial pieces and working through a checklist that probably does seem overwhelming. So I think it does help give some clarity when you can take a step back and just think about what's really important and what do you want to accomplish with your own life. Yeah, exactly. I think those those points are, are right on because when you're in a relationship, your goals might be very different than your partner's goals. So now it's your opportunity to really put a plan in place that gets you, you know, where you want to be. Yeah. And, you know, having that checklist and having someone to work with, especially to work you kind of through the process is really key. Right. So one of my favorite topics uh, is risk management. And and Amy, obviously, when someone is newly divorced, they have to revisit all the possible insurance needs that they might have, whether it's health insurance, property and casualty, disability insurance, life insurance, et cetera. Walk us through what folks need to know. 
Yeah, there, there's a lot here. Um, so there's a lot to look through. But some of the big ones, you know, that I that I've seen frequently, health insurance could be a big factor for a lot of people if you are on a spouse's group plan and maybe now you're not able to be, or I have seen instances where folks are already retired and there's um, you know, some setup where uh even though now you're divorced, you can stay on an ex-spouse's insurance for a period of time if it's you know to get you to Medicare age or something. Something like that. So health insurance is important whether or not you figured it out before the divorce was final or after. Um, if it's after the fact, you know, there's just there's so many options out there. And we all know health insurance uh, does not get cheaper. It's only more expensive as time goes on. And so um, just taking the time to figure out what's the best coverage, whether it is, you know, an option that somebody might have to go through their own employer, or if you're not working, what are your options that can be overwhelming. So just taking the time to figure out and making sure that basic need is covered, that you you have health insurance in place. Uh, that's a really big one. Another one is life insurance. And so kind of going back to what Katie said about the goals, you know, depending on what your goals are, your insurance needs may have changed if your goals have changed. Um, a lot of times we get life insurance to help cover, uh, you know, our financial contribution to our marriage. But if we're no longer uh, married, we th we may not have the same need for life insurance. Um, or, you know, maybe the numbers still support needing the life insurance, but we have to make sure we go through the steps of updating beneficiaries. Um, maybe we don't want an, an ex-spouse listed as the beneficiary anymore. So that's an important thing to go through. And I think it's a two-part um, really consideration is, one, do you still need life insurance? And two, if you do, um, how do you structure it so it matches your goals? You know, make sure that any proceeds go where you want them to. Um, I think for a lot of people, especially, you know, with children, maybe they change it from an ex-spouse to their kids, or if they have a trust set up or something like that, you just, again, want to tie it back to what your goals are. Um, another really important thing, I think that divorced or otherwise, um, insurance consideration is long-term disability. It's something that doesn't get enough attention, but it is important at any stage in your life. But um, it's another really important thing to look at when your your whole financial and, and emotional life changes after a divorce. So long-term disability insurance is really important if you are still working um, and maybe your timeline has changed for when you expected to retire. If there's still a lot of working years ahead of you uh, that are needed to make your, your goals a reality, having long-term disability insurance is really important because it essentially protects your income. And so if, if you, you know, have an unfortunate event, like, you know, something as I'm going to say minor as maybe a car accident that you can recover from, but it takes you out of work for a period of time to something more serious like cancer or some other illness that, you know, it does affect people well, well before, you know, we, we want to think that it does. We tend to think that, oh, you know, all that stuff really happens when, when we're really old, um, but that's not the case. And so I think just, again, having the risk management in place to make sure that whatever the goals are that you first identified, that you are supporting them, even as life continues to throw curveballs, because I'm sure divorce is, is one big one, but there, there's, you know, they're always around every corner. So I think those are some of the really important insurance considerations to look at. Yeah. So insurance is never, um, quite frankly, the most exciting of topics to talk about, but it's certainly one of the most elemental blocking and tackling aspects of a financial plan. Katie, uh, Rick, any additional thoughts? Two things that, that came to mind for me. One was just know when your COBRA, if you have COBRA, insurance know when it expires so you can start planning for it well before the coverage ends and just one other thing that came to mind was for um, some of the clients that I work with who have been out of the workforce have found since their health insurance is such a large expense that if they are able to find work that they enjoy doing and can have that covered for a period of time if they're below Medicare age, that it can be a big sigh of relief from an expense perspective. So that's just something to think about um, how it can, can help the bottom line by getting that coverage through an employer. Yeah. And in cases where someone may have to use ACA, there's also the possibility, depending on their income, of, of receiving advanced premium tax credits as well? Correct. Correct. All right. Rick, any uh, additional thoughts? Yeah. I mean, just a few things I've seen in the years I've been doing this. Um, sometimes on homeowner policies, 
it might have a you know rider for boats or other types of things that might not be in your picture anymore maybe the ex-spouse has that or maybe that car is still on your auto policy things like that but it's a good chance to sit down with your agent and really look at things like deductibles see if there's any gaps in coverage make sure you have an umbrella policy which is just a liability policy over and above any kind of uh, liability that you have on your car because you know we live in a litigious society and if you happen to hit someone with your car or they fall down your stairs you know you want to be protected that way and then lastly one thing i've seen is where the divorce decree might have said that life insurance was supposed to be kept for suppose, for a number of years so you want to be careful of changing beneficiaries which i totally agree with because i've seen more mess ups with people that just never change a beneficiary on whether it's life insurance, whether it's a 401k plan, and that ex post is still on there and it can cause real problems later on. So just wanna be mindful of all those things. As you pointed out, insurance isn't always the most riveting topic, but it is a really important one to look at. Yeah. So Rick, divorced women still need to save and invest for many goals, retirement included. Um, what do divorced women need to know about, uh, about this topic? Well, you know, when you are a married couple, generally speaking, one person hopefully at least is saving towards retirement. If they're both in the workforce, hopefully you're both saving. And then when you split up, you know, in theory, some expenses go away, but you know, two people can live cheaper than one, uh, usually. And uh, so it's important to have, again, that comprehensive financial plan to figure out, you know, what your expenses are going to look like in retirement, and then kind of back into how much money do I need to you know, fund my life once those paychecks stop, whether it's, you know, support of some kind or, you know, money from a job. Once those paychecks stops, you have to rely on other forms like Social Security or maybe a pension or investments and earnings and things like that. So I think it's really important to get a handle on that first and then you can back in and say, I need to save X for a number of years and then just stick to that plan and adjust it as time goes on and if you're working with a, a financial certified financial planner, for an example, hopefully they will keep you on track and make any adjustments that are needed over the years. Yeah, uh, there's also, I think, Rick, this notion of uh, one's risk tolerance uh, may be different going forward as a divorced spouse versus when they were uh, a couple. Absolutely, I, I don't like to stereotype or generalize, but I will uh, because, in my experience, women tend to be more logical thinking when it comes to risk tolerance and investing where some spouses might be much more aggressive and that might not be a good feeling for that you know that that uh, that that divorced spouse so you really want to look at your risk tolerance see what you're comfortable with and it might be a good opportunity to look at certain value type investing too we have clients that want to invest in a certain way whether that's excluding certain things like tobacco and alcohol or you know fossil fuels and things like that, or also be inclusive to try to invest in companies that might, um, you know, have more equal pay for everyone, those types of things. So it's a good time to really, you know, look at it as a, a new journey uh, going forward for yourself versus how it might not have really fit you well as a couple. Yeah. You, you mentioned timelines and the need to reevaluate them. I, I, one thing that comes to mind is oftentimes women may uh, leave the workforce during their childbearing years or may leave the workforce for one reason or another. Uh, and that impacts both their ability to save for retirement and impacts their social security benefits, uh, et cetera. Uh, Amy or Katie, any thoughts about uh, how timelines need to be adjusted given the possibility that women uh, enter and uh, exit and re-enter the workforce? So in, in general, um, women tend to have less saved than men. Um, they just they do studies showing the amount that women have saved and invested versus men. And so in general, women have less saved, but uh, for some of the reasons that you mentioned of not necessarily being in, in the workforce as long. But then on the flip side, women also are more likely to live longer. Than, than men. So we have a little bit of a financial planning conundrum there of we have a little bit less to work with and a longer time horizon in some cases. Of course, there's always exceptions to every every um, situation, but it's it's something that is important to be mindful of and making sure that we're, we're including that as part of our, our plan and that we're making the dollars stretch as, as long as they'll, they'll likely need to go. Mm -hmm. Amy? Yep. 
Yeah, I, I always share uh, when, when it comes to longevity. I have a great aunt who just recently passed away at 107 years old. Oh, um, yeah. And so, yes. <laughs> She, she is definitely one of the exceptions, but women do tend to live longer than men. And so, yeah, Katie, you hit that the nail on the head there. It is really important. I think the only thing I would add is just that um, you don't need to have a lot to make a solid financial plan. You know, I think it can be really overwhelming when you go through a major life change, like a divorce, and then you start thinking about your future and you know, people naturally think about the dollars and the cents. Um, but I have seen plenty of situations where I work with folks that, you know, never made a, a substantial amount of money, but they've been able to do just fine in retirement. Um, on the other hand, I've seen situations where people make more money than you could ever imagine, and they're struggling to plan for their retirement. And so I think the, um, piece of advice I would give is just try not to worry too much if you feel like you don't have enough and sit down with somebody and really look over the numbers, go back to your goals and figure out if what you have is sufficient for you. If you, you know, sometimes people are surprised to find out that, um, you know, by doing things like delaying social security can give them enough monthly income to cover the vast majority of their expenses. And that can be a relief, even if there isn't a ton of investments that have been accumulated. So I think the takeaway is just there's always options and it's really important to explore them all. Yeah. So let's turn our attention to uh, income taxes. Divorced women are sometimes in for a surprise when they file as a single taxpayer uh, when it comes to RMDs or collecting social security. Um, Amy, what, what do folks, what do our divorced uh, audience need to know about income taxes? Yeah, Bob, the big thing, like you mentioned, is, you know, not only do you, has your life changed in so many ways, but your tax situation has also changed quite a bit because now um, you file taxes most likely as a single taxpayer instead of a married taxpayer, which um, has its own set of considerations. And so when you add a lot of the things we've talked about, one being women live longer than men, statistically, uh, women don't have much saved, uh, all of that, uh, for a lot of of divorced uh, folks, there's a, you know, kind of this surprise tax bomb waiting later in life. So as you progress through your life, as you progress through retirement, if you do have pre-tax retirement accounts, you know, at age 72, you have to start withdrawing from them. Well, by 70, you've also started social security. And what I often see is that later in life, especially single taxpayers, um, they start to creep up into higher tax brackets later on, where in the early years, whether it was when they were still working or, you know, after they've retired, but before gotten into their 70s, sometimes there's what we call the opportunity zone, where they have some lower tax years, they can do some long term tax planning to help uh, reduce those future required distributions and, and reduce the amount of taxes they spend um, over their lifetime. And so it all comes back to the importance of having a financial plan, um, looking long term and not not getting so caught up in just the short term. There's, of course, going to be really important short term things that you have to tackle. But it's really important to look at the big picture, look at what your goals are and then map out, you know, what you expect your tax situation to look like over the next, you know, several decades, and then see what decisions you can make, you know, early on to help, uh, you know, limit the amount that goes to taxes. And um, for a lot of people, not only do they like the idea of saving money on taxes, but it's also really comforting to know that if you have a strong tax plan in place, it gives, it has the potential to give you more money to enjoy doing the things you want to do. And so I, I think it's just the the long term view is really important to just spend the time and look at it and and make decisions based on. On, um, you know, the numbers based on the numbers and your goals, instead of just kind of guessing on, on what might be the right choice. Mm. So, um, so far, all that we've talked about uh, does seem like quite a bit of work. Uh, Katie, any thoughts about income taxes and maybe making that topic less painful? So two, two things that came to mind with, with that topic. Um, one, Amy mentioned that most people have to after a divorce is finalized, file as a single taxpayer. Um, and just taking a look at if it was included in your documents, if you have children, if you can file as head of household, every little bit uh, helps. And then the the other piece of just who can, can use the children on their tax return for the, the child tax credits. Uh, another Im important thing, which I 
um, think we all kind of forget because you said it and forget it. But if you are working to take a look at your withholding and see how taxes have been withheld from your employer and if going forward there is changes that you can make. So to, to touch pace with the HR department of, of your company or um, your CPA to make sure that you're not doing too much or too little because uh, that, that can make a difference in our cash flow. Mm. Rick, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, Katie just brought up a good point about, you know, benefits at work made me think about there could be opportunities there. Again, looking at that overall comprehensive financial plan, seeing if you're on track for retirement, it might be a good opportunity to max out uh, your 401k plan if that's available at work, maybe uh, incorporate a flexible spending account that uses pre-tax dollars to pay for medical stuff like, you know, your kids might need braces or things like that, or even a health savings account, an HSA which is really a great vehicle if you have a high deductible health plan, it might be a good fit for you. So I think, again, it, it sounds like this whole thing comes down to having a really good financial plan and someone to help you with all that. Um, but yeah, the tax component can be huge. You know, you're filing single, Katie pointed out, you know, head of household would, would be a, a great thing to do if you're eligible and some people just don't do that if they're doing their taxes on their own, especially. So yeah, I, I think, um, again, look at, look at everything that's available. Right. So I'd like to remind everyone who's attending the webinar that you can ask a question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be leaving more than sufficient amount of time to take questions from everyone here uh, with our esteemed panelists. Um, so I want to turn my attention to uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, retirement planning. Uh, Rick, what, what from your perspective, what do folks need to know about Social Security, uh, RMDs, quadros, divorce spousal benefits, uh, et cetera, joint and survivor uh, uh, pensions, et cetera. We yeah, all... all that good stuff. Well, yeah. we'll start with Social Security. You know, if you're married for at least 10 years and you're divorced, you're entitled to a, uh, a divorce benefit on your spouse. And it's generally 50% of their full retirement age benefit. There are some caveats of when you actually start collecting. If you collect, you know, at 62 versus your full retirement age, you know, your benefit is reduced. If you're married, your spouse that you're collecting on doesn't have to be married, can be married. But if you're married, remarried, um, you, can't, you can't do that. But if they pass away and you remarried after age 60, there's an opportunity to collect 100% of what they were getting. So Social Security plan can be a big piece of that uh, to see where it makes sense to collect, whether it's your own work record or an ex-spouse's record. When it comes to RMDs, you know, uh, I think Katie mentioned at 72, maybe it's Amy, I'm sorry. At 72, you have to start taking these required distributions. And it's a good opportunity. Someone pointed out that there might be a window where your income is lower. And maybe there's some opportunity to, uh, during those low tax bracket years, to do things like Roth conversions, where you could limit the amount of those required distributions that you might need later on, if it seems like you're going to be in a higher tax bracket later. So. Uh, looking at all that, I think really makes sense too. As far as you know, quadros, I've seen situations that a quadro is basically a qualified domestic relations order, and it's generally around someone's 401k or workplace plan to split that up between spouses, so it's not a taxable event. So you want to make sure that um, you know once the divorce is settled, that quadro has not been those assets haven't been uh, transferred. You want to make sure that that gets done properly because that. I've seen cases where that sits around for five, six years and just never gets done. And that's not ideal. Yeah. What what advice do you have around making sure that it does get done? What, uh, uh, working with a planner, put, having yeah, a absolutely. checklist in place? Yeah, absolutely. Working with a planner, having that, that post-divorce checklist to some, make sure nothing's forgotten. You know, the checklist, I think is a great idea, you know, because it could be as simple as saying, you know, check beneficiaries. Is the quadro completed if there was one? Um, was the house retitled, you know, if you're keeping the house? All those things are really important because it's easy to forget this stuff, even for, for us that do it every day. So you really want to have some kind of checklist, check it off. I always feel good checking things off personally. I've even written things down just so I can check them off, but, um, but it's a good feeling. And I think, the, I think the, the client feels good too, knowing that they're making some progress. Yeah. Katie, I know you're fond of checklists. Uh, any additional thoughts on <laughs> quadros and social security and RMDs and retirement planning in general? 
Yes, I make a checklist for everything. I, I would just echo a, a basic, what Amy was saying earlier about not getting overwhelmed or feeling like that you maybe aren't exactly where you'd want to be at a certain point, um, because the reality of of a lot of a divorces is, is that you had a pot of money that's now split in two, and that regardless of how big or small that amount is, it can make people feel uneasy because you're planning with a different amount than what you had been previously. So what I like to remind people is that in any retirement planning, there's always levers to pull. You can save more, spend less, work longer. It it just depends on your priorities. So before you get overwhelmed by looking at how the dollars have changed, also taking a look at how maybe some of your habits could be adjusted to where you can still end up in the same place, but just what levers can can you pull? And for for different people, that's that's a different answer. So just exploring those options and seeing um, how to get to a comfortable place with with getting to retirement. Mm-hmm. Amy, I think I just will emphasize the importance of the social security planning. Social security is like many of the topics we're discussing. A lot. There's a lot of rules. There's a lot of nuances, but there's also a lot of benefit. And I think some people are often surprised when we put the numbers on paper to show how much value Social Security could provide over a lifetime and then how that value can change depending on if you start benefits earlier or later. And so I think just emphasize the importance, again, of just taking the time to work through these things carefully. Um, A lot of the decisions that you make when it comes to retirement planning are, you know, one and done. You you make the choice and you, you you want to make the right one. And so to make the right one and not regret a decision or make it hastily, I think it's just really important to spend the time working through all the details. Yeah. I, I know when I uh, talk to readers, they're often surprised that they're entitled to divorce uh, spousal benefits or even a deceased beneficiary's benefits. Do you find that to be the case in your practice that uh, that divorced women are uh, are sort of taken aback that they can receive those benefits? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes people are, they just didn't know what the rules were, or there's just such, you know, so much conflicting information out there, they didn't understand them the right way. Um, There's also a lot of confusion about, you know, the the amount that you can receive. So I've had a lot of people come to me and say, oh, well, I I, I thought I could just get 50% of, you know, my ex-spouse's benefit because we were married for 10 years. And um, that is partially true, but sometimes, you know, you 50% of their benefit may not be as much as if you took your own benefit. And so Social Security, the the way that it is tended to work is when you do file for benefits, they look at an ex-spouse's record and they give you the biggest benefit you're entitled to. But um, sometimes Social Security doesn't always know all the rules, you know, depending on who you talk to when you call. And so um, I think it's just important, again, to just not only spend the time to do your own homework, um, and some people don't love doing their own homework, and that's okay. Um, That's why it just makes it even more valuable to work with a planner that can help you go through all of those pieces and make sure that what you heard or what you think you're entitled to um, is, you know, the right thing for you. Yeah. So they're not as prevalent as they once were, but some folks still have divine benefit plans. And uh, typically the beneficiary can choose a single life or maybe a joint and survivor uh, option as well. Katie, any thoughts of, uh, about what folks, divorced women need to know about divine benefit plans? Oh, as far as receiving them? Yeah, after the post-divorce, yeah. yeah. So there's that that can be a little complex. Most of the time it's determined kind of what's going to happen with those plans during the divorce. So oftentimes I'll see that um, a, a client will, or maybe you didn't necessarily work at an employer, but you're entitled to a portion of uh your ex-spouse's pension and some places it's easier and harder to get information. Some of them you have an option with to get a lump sum. Others, you can take it at your retirement age. There's a lot of different rules. So my, it can get a little complex, but what I would say is to make sure you call, get all of the information that you can from, from the plan administrator and understand timing, what those payout amounts might be, what happens to your benefits if something were to happen to you, if you could name a beneficiary. There's um, just 
a lot to make sure that you get the information and then you know when you can start taking those benefits and how best to receive them. So uh, that that's where just getting the information is the first step because every plan is different. Mm. So we've covered a lot of ground. The, the last big topic is estate planning and divorced women, obviously they need to update their wills, durable powers of attorney. We mentioned beneficiary designations and, and the like. Katie, uh, uh, talk more about estate planning for divorced women. Yeah, estate planning tends to fall, I think, in the bottom of everybody's list. It's, you know, thinking about our own death is not really something um, most of us want to do but it's really important and particularly after a divorce. So I use this example because um, I think it really hits hits the, the point that I'm trying to make, but assume that you were to go out tomorrow and were hit by a bus and you haven't updated any of your documents. Do you really want your ex-spouse to be the one making decisions about your healthcare if you haven't updated it? And if it were me, I would say, Absolutely not. That's not really who I'd want in charge. Not necessarily um, a bad thing. Sometimes that might be still the person you want, but having the option to take a look at your entire uh, estate plan and decide who are the people that you trust and that you want in those roles that may be different. I mean, oftentimes when you're married, it's by default, you pick your spouse to make those decisions, both from a financial perspective and um, a health perspective and named in your will. <clears throat> that likely has changed for most people. You might want to name, if you have adult children, um, to name them or maybe a sibling or somebody else that you you know will carry out your wishes. And I'd say a lot of our planning from a state planning perspective changes after a divorce of you know what we want to happen with the dollars that we have, where we want them to go. Um, that are they different people? Do you have charities in mind? So we always recommend to meet with an estate planning attorney. Most of the time, you're going to want to start from scratch because if you did have documents in place previously, they might not be as relevant anymore. Uh, but you just want to make sure that you have the right people in place to ensure that your wishes are carried out if something were to happen to you, um, also important if you have children and there's, you know, decisions that you want to make sure are known and in writing. And um, if, you know, there's funds being left to them who you want to be the guardian of that. So there's, there's quite a bit um, from a planning perspective of just making sure your wishes are known and updated and, and you continue to keep them relevant. Mm. Rick or Amy? Thoughts to add? A, a couple of thoughts came up for me. One of the big ones is, um, yes, super important to update all your estate planning documents, but also really important to know that just because you update, say, your last will, if you don't um, also update all of the beneficiaries on your other accounts to match, uh, the will kind of, to a certain extent, can be irrelevant. What I mean by that is if your will says one thing, but the beneficiary on, say, your retirement account says something else, the beneficiary listed on the actual account is what is going to hold true. And so I think it's just important to know it's not it's not as simple like most things. It's not as simple as just update your estate planning. You still have to go through each account to make sure all the beneficiaries match. So everything says the same thing. Um, the other thing is that if you are working and you uh, work for a large enough company, a lot of big companies offer the option to enroll in a legal plan benefit during open enrollment. Um, I know when people hear the term estate planning or an estate planning attorney, they see dollar signs and they say, oh, that sounds really expensive. And it can be. Um, I mean, basic estate plans uh, usually run a couple thousand dollars. Uh, so one way to still tackle it, but more maybe cost effectively is if you have a legal plan benefit through work. Um, it's something that you don't want to postpone, 
you know, you want to tackle it. And so with legal benefits through work, usually you can only uh, enroll in them during open enrollment or if there's a qualifying event. So you may have the option to to sign up for one, even if it's not open enrollment. But I think the, the short version of the story is make sure you, you your new estate plan matches all the account beneficiaries and also just look at options on how you can try to get your estate planning done, um, you know, for, for as a, an affordable cost as possible. Mm. So we have some questions that have come in from our uh, attendees. Uh, I'll just go through them uh, one by one and uh, we, they can be a uh, jump all. Uh, I, I did not get the house in my divorce and have been told by friends that I'll be renting from here on out. Is it feasible for a mid 60s age person to consider purchasing a small house once the har- housing market cools? Or is it better to hold on to the small amount uh, I'll have towards living expenses, medical as I age? Good question. <laughs> I, I find the house is one of those areas that's probably the, one of the biggest topics on, in a divorce. Uh, who gets the house? Someone wants to hold on to the house. And many times it's not a financial reason. It's an emotional reason. And we were I was raised that renting was throwing money away. So you want to always buy a house. But I have found, especially as I've gotten older um, and don't want to get up on a ladder and clean gutters, that renting is not really the worst thing in the world. And I think, again, it comes down to having that comprehensive financial plan to see you know, when you own a house, people sometimes think, well, I've got the mortgage payment, I've got taxes, I've got insurance and a water bill maybe, and then that's it. But stuff happens in a house, right? The roof needs to be replaced, the boiler breaks down, the water heater lets go at 3 a.m. So there could be ongoing costs that you might not incur while you're renting. So I think, you know, you really want to look at that um, and, you know, make your life as easy as possible. Sometimes renting is the right answer, sometimes buying. Just like it depends is kind of that catchphrase for a lot of financial pieces. Yeah. Amy, Katie? I agree 100%. I, I have run scenarios. Um, you know, I've been asked that exact question. And what we do is we run a side by side comparison. If all else is the same, here's one version where you do buy a house, here's one version where you rent. We, you know, typically assume rent does increase with inflation as the years go on, because that's what happens in real life. And the house version, we do try to account for some annual cost to maintain and, and, and repair a home. And we just look at the numbers. What looks better? You know, what looks better? It, 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 you're making guesses. You have to have some assumptions in there. But it is a really helpful way to, instead of just guess, like, how does it feel? Um, what, what numbers actually look like your retirement plan will be more sustainable? So I think that's one way to approach it is first you look at the numbers and, uh, you know, if, if the numbers very clearly show one is better than the other, sometimes that's all you need. Um, what I do find is a lot of the times the numbers don't really necessarily show one is that much different. And so then it comes back to the values conversation of, you know, if if you rent or you buy, maybe the plan still looks great, but which one feels better? Do you feel better having your own place that you can call yours? Or do you feel better knowing that if, you know, you get termites, you can call a landlord and they can come take care of it. So it's kind of all those pieces together. Yeah. Katie, I'm sure you have some thoughts too. Well, and the only thing I was thinking, because this, this is a question we get a lot of, you know, what makes the most sense? And I, I hate the answer is oftentimes it depends. It depends, it depends on how it's been <laughs> and what that might look like. But uh, really, you know, there's the, the question of, does it need to come out of my portfolio or should I save it? I mean, there's also the option of like, does it make sense to take a, an amount out for a down payment and then have, or do you qualify for a mortgage? And can you get a mortgage to where you're in a comfortable house that's maybe spending less than what you were on rent? So another one of those examples of like, there's always variables but that you can can adjust in different scenarios. So um, that would be one where you kind of, just, yeah, you have to crunch the numbers, but um, at the end of the day, you know, where are you most comfortable? And um, what's going to provide you like the greatest chances of success having in your portfolio that you can access it or, you know, helping with cash flow by owning a home. Right. Uh, Another question is, how do you plan for retirement and your kids' futures when you only have one income? Some of us don't have child support or alimony. If, uh, If there is any money left over, how best to invest for the kids? 529 versus custodial account versus other options. Another great, great question. Um, the, the first 
thing that I often think of is you can always borrow money for college and you cannot do the same for your retirement. So make sure, I know it's hard. I'm a mom myself. So I um, want to set my kids up with, you know, to be successful, to do everything in my power, to make sure that they have the money that they need to do X, Y, and Z. But um, a good way to think of it is like doing, you're doing them a a service by taking care of you first, make sure you have what you need in retirement. And then what makes sense if, you know, how much do you want to contribute to the future? What is the goal for the money? If it is for college, then 529s are an excellent tool. And um, if you want to just have some money set aside for them to have complete flexibility of what they use the money on, then custodial account is a good option. If you want to set it aside in a brokerage account in your name, and you don't necessarily know where you want it to go or what that will look like, but the ability to use it on yourself if you need to, that's when I go to the third option for, for a brokerage account. But for kind of pay yourself first and then really be clear about what you want to save for for your kids and then see if you can come up with some compromise to make sure you're taking care of both goals but not sacrificing um, your retirement first. Mm, great advice. Amy or Rick? Yeah, I I agree with with all of that. Um, I I went through a brief moment of thinking I was going to start, you know, being really generous and saving for my kids' future, and then all of a sudden we had three of them, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> let's let's go back and look at my goals, and you know what I what I try to think of too. You know, everything Katie said is totally true, but um, I also just think of if you save for your retirement first, you know, one of the kind of lights at the end of the tunnel you can look forward to is if you put yourself in a really good place for your retirement, maybe what will happen is by the time your your child gets to college age, you are in a better position to maybe help them. You know, you've saved for yourself and maybe you don't have a ton saved towards their college or saved towards their first home or whatever it may be, but now you're more financially secure enough to be able to, you know, maybe help them with covering some of the costs of books or, you know, taking money from your own savings to just help make their life a little bit easier. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Yeah. And I think college planning could be a whole other webinar, actually, a 10 hour one. But, um, you know, as a single parent that's not um, earning a huge amount of income, there are opportunities for more financial aid. So and we don't know if, if the child is two years old now, we don't know 16 years from now what that's going to look like. But um, again, I think Amy and Katie are right on board. It's like kind of like putting the, you know, the uh, oxygen mask on yourself first on the plane before you put on someone else, because if you don't take care of yourself, then your kids are going to end up taking care of you. And that's probably not a good thing either. So mm. retirement first, there's always a way to pay for college. But as Katie pointed out, I, as far as I know, I haven't seen any loans for retirement, mm. unless it's like a home equity line of credit. And that's not a good strategy. So don't do that. So yeah, um, there's always a way to pay for college. It might be a, a different school, or it might be, you know, something else. So yeah. Uh, another question is, how do you find a retirement planner who is also an expert on taxes? I can't seem to find them wrapped into one person. And then when they are separate, the perspectives and advice don't mesh. Hmm. That's interesting. So um, I, I'm thinking they mean like saving for retirement, like having a retirement plan, but also looking at the tax implications. Um, you know, there are uh, certified financial plans that are also CPAs um, out there. So, and there are also certified financial planners that are very well versed in, in taxes. So um, I would just recommend probably interviewing more people and finding the right fit. Yeah. It, it's, it's also becoming increasingly common for firms to have CPAs on staff. I know at Buckingham, we have CPAs that will actually um, do your tax return and then you have an advisor and then they work together to make sure that your retirement plan and your tax plan are cohesive. So I think that is becoming more and more common at, at firms. So that might be a good option um, looking for a firm in your area that has an offering similar to that. Amy? Yeah, we do the same um, as Katie described. And I would say also uh, one of the things that I find is that if if you look for a financial planner who 
leads with a financial plan, usually you can find more of that comprehensive advice. What I mean by that is a lot of times it's unfortunate, but people call themselves financial planners or financial advisors, and they don't ask you anything about you know a financial plan. They just want to manage your investments, which is an important piece of the puzzle. But um, generally, you know, like like what we we always say at Sensible Money is, you know, if you ask us how to invest your money, we're going to say, well, we have no idea. What's your plan? We need to know the plan so we know how to invest your money. And I think if you go out looking for um, a financial planner or an advisor that does the plan first, usually you find that that approach also translates really well into also looking at the tax piece too, because they are connected. Uh, another question we got uh, revolves around, uh, we mentioned risk tolerance earlier about investment um, planning and invest, saving and investing. Uh, the comment is, I can say that risk capacity will also change uh, and it should be reassessed along with risk tolerance. As a result, as the asset allocation strategy will most likely change and the new financial plan will be the blueprint for this. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean as your risk capacity changes, depending on most of the time after a divorce, not only will the tolerance for risk, but also it becomes for a lot of people, they kind of need and want a sense of security. So the, um, as far as risk is concerned, it becomes just as important, if not more important to retain what they've saved and what they've walked away with. And that outweighs sometimes doubling or tripling it in a if, if that if you're following me there just um the financial situations change so certainly I, I i would agree with that rick or amy any additional thoughts yeah i think risk tolerance is one of those things that's you know depending on when you when you measure someone's risk tolerance like if you measured it this year i think you would get a very different score than if you measured it two years ago so it's it's usually changing as someone ages it probably changes you know because they're getting closer to maybe not working so it's something that um is an important conversation to have and ongoing as well yeah yeah i would just add too that um if you're talking to a, a financial planner and you don't feel comfortable with their approach, keep looking. Um, there is not, it's not a one size fits all. There are lots of approaches out there to, you know, investing in, in retirement planning, and you have to find one that you're comfortable with. So, it, you know, I think it's important to interview a lot of different people and find one that, that just does feel like the, the right fit for you. Um, you know, some approaches are, uh, you know, more risk averse and some are more comfortable with risk and you have to find the one that that yeah. you can sleep at night using because right. uh, you know if, if it's something that that you don't feel good about you're you're not going to enjoy it you're not going to feel comfortable with it and you're probably going to change course at, at not a good time so you need something that that fits with you so we have about 10 minutes left we have a boatload of questions here i'll try to go through them as quickly as possible uh, the next one reads i'll try to paraphrase uh, if someone has sufficient equity in their house, could they look at a reverse mortgage for purchase with no mortgage having to be made? So if they have sufficient equity, that would assume they already own own the house. Um, yes, it's an option. That's that's certainly an option. I have I have clients with reverse mortgages that it made sense at the time. So really, that's one of those things that you'd have to evaluate. All right, that I'll move on to the next one. We'll do, sort of do these rapid fire. Um, what do you do first? Find a financial planner or an estate planning attorney? Can one person set you up with everything? How do you leave money for someone who has a mental illness? Great questions. So, you know, uh, I think they both dovetail together because definitely someone with mental illness, you know, you would probably use a special needs trust. You need an estate planning attorney to do that piece. I personally would, I'm guessing biased, but I would start with the financial planner because they have other relationships generally with you know, CPAs and estate planning attorneys, and they might be able to find a really good fit for you based on their needs. So that that's where I would start. Yeah, I would I would just say uh, to you know start with if you find a really good estate planning attorney and you trust them, um, you start there and they probably have recommendations for a financial planner just like the other way around. So I do think it it goes back to finding someone you're comfortable with first and foremost. Katie, you look like you're about to say something. Oh no, I was just reading reading the questions. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. So let's see. The next one I have is uh, I plan on selling my house when I have two of my three out of the house. Should I invest the profit from selling my house approximately six years away or put profit towards a smaller mortgage when you would be about 10 years from retirement? That dreaded answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the math. I I would say if it was two years ago, uh, most of the time the math would would support you know taking the cash and investing it because mortgage rates were so low. Um, with mortgage rates continuing to creep up, now you know running the numbers and really look, doing a comparison is so much more important because um, it does it does really depend. I think when you're looking at retirement planning, generally you know we you want to assume a pretty conservative rate of return on your retirement investments. Kind of the the concept of you want to uh, under promise and, and over deliver. You'd rather plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, so if you were conservatively saying, you know, oh, I, my, my retirement investments maybe will average 5% a year over my lifetime, but now you have to get a mortgage with a 7% interest rate, you know, quick math just says, oh, I'm paying 7% um, on the debt and I'm only going to earn 5% on the investments. I would rather pay off that mortgage as quick as possible. Um, those are some of the rules of thumb, but it really does come down to, again, comprehensive plan and, and just looking at how all the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm. No getting around that plan. I think. Yeah, it, we all need uh, bumper stickers. It depends. That's, it depends. that's the, the, <laughs> the financial planner's favorite answer. All right, we got uh, one last question here. Uh, what if you had everything in place, including long-term disability, and became disabled, and employer long-term disability denied your benefits? Typical, can never work, and you're only 57 years old. Uh, SSDI doesn't cover much, even though I'm maxed from it. Uh, is the only option alimony modification. What happens when I turn 65 and alimony, uh, a very low amount ends? That's a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that one. <laughs> Not a simple answer for sure. No. And, 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 and that would be a, a good example of a time where working with someone who can take a look at your current disability policy Make sure that, I mean, of course you want to look at it before you're you're disabled to make sure that it is the type of coverage that you're hoping and needing. Um, it sounds like you're already disabled. So having someone look and make sure that the the insurance company is correct in their denying of benefits, that there there's not some any other options there. Um, yeah, and as far as I would I would just see if I could find somebody who knows disability insurance well and the um, options with social security to help you evaluate those options. I actually might start with going back to the attorney that you worked with and seeing if there is um, how much it'll cost to modify your, your alimony. And if there are any options to um, having it go beyond 65, but that really depends on, you know, your case and what state you live in and what what the options are there so i in your case i might start back with the the divorce attorney and then um, work somewhat worth with someone who specializes in disability mm. yeah and I, I imagine that some disability insurance companies you know just deny a claim the first time around like social security might so it's definitely worth again like katie mentioned get an expert in that look at that reapply and challenge them and maybe they'll change their answer yeah yeah uh, so we have about four minutes left. I want to leave time for each of you to sort of um, provide some summation of what uh, of the what now question now that uh, uh, someone might be divorced and, and embarking on their new life. Uh, uh, Rick, why don't we start with you? So I guess we start with it depends. <laughs> and also, uh, it's really important to have a, a good comprehensive holistic plan to really look at every detail. And again, as Katie pointed out, we, we don't want to overwhelm people. So we just bite off as much as we can chew and start with the more important things first and then work our way down the list. And it might take, you know, a few months, it might take a year, but it'll get done. And especially if you're working with someone that can kind of keep you on track, I think that's really, really key. Mm. Amy? Yes, I 100% I agree with the uh, comprehensive financial plan, identifying what your goals are, and then, you know, 
sitting down and taking the time to map it all out is important. I think the other thing I would just say is I, I always try to be a glass half full person. And I think we all go through really challenging times in our life, some more so than others. But as hard as it is to go through it, I, I always just try to remind people that you will get through it. It's going to stink right now while you're in the thick of it. it. It usually is, you know, really overwhelming and it's hard to think about what life might be like on the other side. But I think that um, also just adds to the importance of sitting down, thinking about your goals and, um, you know, trying as, as much as you can to think of it as a fresh start and a new opportunity. And, um, you know, hopefully it, it's the bad stuff's behind you and the good stuff is what you have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Katie, you get the last word here. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to go very simple advice, just staying organized. You have a laundry list of things that we've told you, we've shared with you a lot on your to-do list. One of the best things you can do for yourself is just stay organized. And if um, you need a little bit of help finding someone to be an accountability partner, if you don't have access to a financial advisor or aren't already working with someone, find someone else in your life that can check in with you to make sure that you're getting all of these um, things crossed off your list because they're so, so important. So just find uh, anyone that is willing to help uh, nudge you along and, and provide friendly reminders. Mm. Well, Rick, Katie, and uh, Amy, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with our uh, attendees today. It is greatly appreciated. And I want to thank um, all the attendees for today's session. Uh, it has been recorded. We will post it on Retirement Daily so you can view it again if you miss something or want to re-listen to it uh, at a future date. And uh, and uh, again, we'll thank you. We plan to do these webinars uh, every quarter. We plan to focus on a different topic. Uh, I, I guess I should ask uh, Amy, Rick, uh, uh, Katie, is there a topic that we should drill down on on the next webinar? Peace. Um... Trying to think what's the most right. important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, investing in retirement planning, we could we could probably all three talk for, for hours about each of those topics. So getting a little bit more specific on strategies and ideas and things like that would would will probably serve people well. Yeah. Right. Perfect. That'll be the topic for the next one. So thank you again for thank attending you. and thank you for being our special uh, guest today to help folks. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye.